Hi everybody, tonight we're going to talk about equilibrium in the aggregate supply and aggregate demand models. We're going to talk about four things. We'll talk about short run macro equilibrium, we'll talk about shifts of aggregate demand, the short run effects of that, we'll talk about shifts of the short run aggregate supply curve, and we'll talk about long run macroeconomic equilibrium. So if we put together the modules that we've discussed over the past two days, we get the short run aggregate supply and the, the aggregate demand curve coming together and finding equilibrium. This is very similar to what we discussed and studied back in micro. Remember, remember that when the price level rises above the intersection of aggregate demand and short-run aggregate supply, what happens? There's a surplus of aggregate, aggregate output in the economy. What happens when there's a surplus of output? Well, prices begin to fall because there's more out there than people want to buy. When the price level goes below the intersection of aggregate demand and aggregate supply, there's a shortage of aggregate output in the, in the economy. And when there's a shortage of output, what happens? Prices begin to rise. So this model very similar to the model we studied in micro. Let's introduce this idea of demand shock. A demand shock is nothing more than an event that causes the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left or to the right. And this should have said left here. Sorry, I copied and pasted incorrectly. Let's take a couple of, let's take a look at a couple of things and you'll recognize from the discussions we had a couple of days ago regarding demand when we talked about factors that cause them to shift. Shock is just a fancy term for what happens when they shift. So the loss of wealth in 1929 caused by the uh, crash of the stock market, so loss of overall, overall household wealth caused a huge negative demand shock. So a decrease in demand for goods and services because people felt much less wealthy. What happened? Well, it led to a lower aggregate price level and lower aggregate output, and that's what we suffered during the Great Depression. Alternatively, what brought us out of the Depression was largely or arguably a positive demand shock that happened when government spending increased dramatically, gearing up for and fighting World War II caused aggregate demand because government spending is, is one of the factors that shifts demand. Aggregate demand went way up. And what happens? Well, it led to higher aggregate price level and higher aggregate output because that demand, again, government demand, drove this change. Keep in mind, demand shocks cause prices, so price level and GDP, to move in the same direction. You can see here that we have movements when this went down, this went down as well, and when price went up here, output went up as well. Let's talk now about the other side, which is supply shock and shifts of the short-run aggregate supply curve, again using the examples that we discussed in today's class. For example, oil shortages in 1973, so a change in, in the availability of commodities caused the short-run aggregate supply curve to shift dramatically to the left because there was less supply. Well, what happens? It leads to lower aggregate output and higher aggregate price levels. Conversely, dramatic increases in efficiency due to the internet, not dues, due to the creation and use of the internet in the, I would say, very late 80s and through the 90s caused dramatic increases in productivity. And what, would, what did that do? Cost of producing went down, so supply increased. Again, as this graph shows, leads to higher aggregate output and a lower aggregate price level as a result. Now, so keep in mind, too, that supply shock causes prices and GDP to move in opposite directions. So, in contrast to demand shocks where they move in the same direction, supply shocks cause them to move in opposite directions. There's an important term that we use when we see something like a negative supply shock. It's called stagflation, stagnation plus inflation. What happens in this case, we know, we just talked about the fact that price levels increase and output falls. This creates a downward dangerous spiral for the economy because output is decreasing and prices are going up. It's very, very hard to come out of a stagflation, uh, that kind of an environment, again, when prices are going up and output is going down. We'll talk more about that as we get into uh, further discussions of uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Keep in mind too, it is much easier for the government to intervene to move aggregate demand than it is to move short-run aggregate supply. Uh, part of the reason that it's very hard to get out of a stagflationary environment 
is that the government can easily stimulate demand or pull back demand by cha making changes in the money supply or making changes in investment. It's very hard for the government to do things that change supply. Now, long run macroeconomic equilibrium, what does it look like? Well, what it looks like very simply is the intersection of the short run aggregate supply curve, the aggregate demand curve, and long run aggregate supply. So what this says is, is that the economy in the long run is going to tend toward the point where prices and output end up at this intersection, which is consistent with what we've been talking about uh, in the context of long run aggregate supply and how it functions relative to short run supply. Now, let's talk about what happens to this long run equilibrium when we have a negative demand shock. It's, very, it's a series of steps and let's go through them one by one. So we'll have an initial negative demand shock, any one of a number of items, moves demand back this way and what happens? Well, it reduces the aggregate price level and the aggregate output down to here and what does that do? That leads to higher unemployment in the short run. Well, if employment is higher in the short run, we have what if we have put, if we have employment higher unemployment and a gap in output we have what's called a recessionary gap so we've been talking about the great recession that started in 2008 and we're just coming out of today this gap again is defined by the difference between potential output and what's actually happening as a result of this negative demand shock and decreases in price levels now what happens over time, eventually when you have this high level of unemployment and you have low prices, wages are going to fall. What happens when wages fall? Well, you get this decrease in nominal wages and in the long run, what happens? Well, it increases short run aggregate supply because people will be willing to work for less, which decreases the cost of production, increases supply. And look what happens. It moves the economy back to this point of eventual output. Importantly, you're seeing return to potential output, but at a lower overall level of prices. Now let's look to it short run versus long run effects of a positive demand shock. Well, an initial positive demand shock does what? It moves us, it moves us from our initial spot here, which is AD1 and SR. SRAS1, what happens? An initial positive demand shock moves prices from P1 to P2 and also creates a gap between potential output and actual output. So here's what happens. We have a move over here. Well, what happens? Eventually, we're going to get a rise in nominal wages in the long run which is going to reduce short run aggregate supply because it will be harder for producers to produce goods and it's going to move the economy back to potential output that's along the run, long run aggregate supply curve. And I, I'm sorry, I skipped a step here. I talked about it, but I didn't, didn't identify it in the box. We talked about an initial positive demand shock. We talked about increases in aggregate price level and aggregate output and reductions in unemployment. And then we talked about the move to step three. We're going to go through all this again today and we'll discuss why it creates this inflationary gap rather than a recessionary gap when we're producing. We talked today about the economy overheating. This is what's happening when price levels are going up. And we're seeing this uh, reduction in unemployment. Okay, so putting all together, when the economy is at a long run equilibrium, We've talked about the fact that there's either a recessionary or an inflationary gap. So we identified here an inflationary gap, here a recessionary gap. Those are important terms. Now we can measure the gap in terms of how far the actual output is away from potential output. Here is that calculation. You can uh, pause and take a look at that if you need to. Definitions of recessionary inflation inflationary gaps here, just the steps that we talked about in the in the uh, two prior charts. And keep in, mi keep in mind that in the long run the economy is going to be self-correcting. We talked about how the economy is correcting itself here over time, getting back to long-run aggregate supply. Key economic concepts. So 
Keep in mind, the model assumes the economy is always in a state of short-run equilibrium, where aggregate demand intersects short-run aggregate supply. It doesn't always coincide with, coincide with potential GDP, though, or Y sub P. If current real GDP differs from potential output in GDP, there is either a recessionary or inflationary gap in the short run. In the long run, remember, when all prices are flexible, the model tells us that short-run aggregate supply will adjust so that, once again, the aggregate demand, short-run aggregate supply, and long-run aggregate supply all intersect at Y sub P, potential output. And keep in mind as well, external shocks to the aggregate demand or short-run aggregate supply affect the equilibrium price level and real GDP. But again, we will tend back to our potential output. That's it. Have a great night, and I will see you tomorrow.